Get ready to enter a brave new world with your host, Vasant Dar. Hello and welcome to Brave New World. Today's episode is about medicine and healthcare. I want to dedicate this episode to two people who changed my life in graduate school. The first was Herb Simon, considered one of the fathers of AI, with the rare distinction of winning the Nobel Prize and the Turing Award. Simon was incredibly generous with his time and actively engaged with me every week during my PhD thesis. I only realized the extent of his generosity so much later. The second individual was Harry Popel, the architect of the system called Internist, which was the first diagnostic system that covered the field of internal medicine. In fact, my aha moment happened when I first saw a veteran physician, Jack Myers, talking to Internist. Myers couldn't type, so his secretary, Roseanne, typed for him. She had entered an initial list of symptoms provided by Myers. The machine asked some questions, steering the dialogue according to Myers' responses asking for more information, including lab tests, additional symptoms, etc. Myers provided answers and said, don't know, to some questions. The system then asked whether the patient had experienced any abdominal pains. Why? asked Myers. Internist said that the answer to that question would help it discriminate between the top two contending hypotheses. I was really blown away. How the hell was a machine doing this? That's the kind of thing I wanted to be able to build. During the next five years, I saw hundreds of physicians discussing cases with internists, sometimes walking away puzzled, but rarely dissatisfied. Its diagnostic accuracy, to the extent that one could actually measure it, was impressive. Looking back, the reasoning ability of the machine was amazing. Its knowledge base had been painstakingly assembled over more than 10 years of interaction between Myers and Popel. It knew about all kinds of things, like disease hierarchies and causal relationships, which were invoked through a control mechanism that kept the dialogue focused. That was over 40 years ago. But looking back at that impressive system, what it required from the physician was that the case be described accurately. All the scans, charts, bedside interactions, and notes had to be recorded and entered into internist faithfully and in the way that it could understand. In the old world, we had to describe the world to machines. Now they see the same things like we do, like images and interpret sounds and symbols. That's unleashed a torrent of innovation. It's made it possible for machines to work with the same inputs as humans. It has enabled them to go deeper into medicine and see even things that humans can't. It's a whole new world of healthcare where machines can do a lot more of the heavy lifting while humans focus on the care part of healthcare, that is, the human aspects. Joining me today on Brave New World is Eric Topol, Endowed Chair of Innovative Medicine at Scripps Research and the author of Deep Medicine. All I can say is that everyone should read Deep Medicine. It brought me up to speed on the problems facing healthcare, the -the state-of-the-art research findings in medicine, and the role of humans and machines in healthcare. It's very well written and accessible to non-specialists like myself. Eric, welcome to Brave New World. I'm thrilled to have you on the show. There's a lot I want to talk to you about based on your new book, Deep Medicine. But before we get into that, tell us a little bit about yourself, like how you got to this juncture of being at the forefront of AI and medicine, and more broadly, about the roles of humans and machines in healthcare. Uh, Well, I've been around for a while now. Uh, and I've kind of, you know, worked in different areas, but my, my real interest is in the space of genomics, but clearly I realized along the way that that wasn't going to be enough understanding a person's genome. So that's how I got into digital and eventually into AI, but I'm a information junkie. I think people may know that from those who follow me on Twitter and I read a lot. And uh, fortunately, I've been gifted to be able to read quickly, not always with 100% accurate comprehension, but at least fast. So those are some things that some people might not know about me. Well, I'm a information junkie myself. So uh, 
And I thoroughly enjoyed your book. So let's start with that. You know, there was a word cloud right in the beginning, and I showed that to a friend of mine, and I said, what do you think this corresponds to? You know, arrogant, uncaring, rude, hurried, rushed, uninterested, late, unconcerned. And the response was, you know, are you talking about uh, Donald Trump? <laughs> <laughs> so that was sort of an interesting uh, take on that. But let's start there. You know, why are we in this situation where people perceive doctors that way? And why are doctors in that position? What's the underlying cause of the problem here? Right. Well, you know, that word cloud grabbed me, uh, Vasan, as it has uh, you, because it's medicine today. It's rushed. Uh, it's superficial. We've lost the uh, human touch and human connection, which is the essence of medicine. And we have to get it back. So, you know, I think in that one example of just two words that describe patient's experience with a health system, one of the leading health systems in the United States, in fact, it conveyed the desperate situation that we're in today and why there are so many mistakes, why people feel that they're not getting adequate care. And that care is, is a human thing. It's not a machine thing, of course. And I think the point I, I started the book with, I got roughed up, you know, with knee surgery. And that also was the experience that I had. That word, word cloud was, you know, very much consonant with what I experienced when I saw an orthopedist in follow-up because he was seeing about 20 patients, you know, in 20 minutes or something like that. Uh, just walking in from the door, one from the next. And, you know, it was obvious he was uh, he had little time to, to spend with me. That that has to change. That 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 is unacceptable. And it's been a steady erosion uh, over decades now. Your book has lots of numbers. In fact, you know, what you just mentioned, the average time, I don't know, 30 years ago used to be 30 to 60 minutes. Now it's just a few minutes, right? So, you know, there are, numbers you present in your book around screening, like 30 million people are screened for prostate cancer, you know, 6 million have elevated PSA, you know, there's 1 million biopsies, 180,000 cancer diagnoses, and an equal number that are missed, you know, and you have similar numbers for breast cancer, you know, some of the most commonly occurring kinds of ailments. And this is scary. I mean, how do we get there? You know, you point to shallow medicine. Right. Tell us a little bit more about why we're ending up with this level of screening, this number of false negatives, false positives. What's the problem? Right. And how would you summarize the problem, the cause <laughs> yeah. of this? Yeah. So the term shallow medicine that I came up with was trying to take the time element that we just discussed, Vasan, to another level which is we rely on very inadequate tests to make important decisions. So I think the best example is the mammograms that you mentioned, because here, if you take the prototypic population of women who are between age 50 and 60, who have the highest risk of manifesting breast cancer, and you put them through a yearly mammogram, as is the custom, the ritual in the United States, out of the 10,000 women, you only help six women as far as accurate diagnosis. I mean, it's extraordinary. And you have a false diagnosis rate along those 10 years of 60%. 60%, which is incredible. Staggering. Yeah. I mean, that is all the women who go through all this anxiety, many of whom, not all, of course, but many get biopsies or get repeat scans and we're relying on tests that are that are pathetic. And the PSA is yet another example for prostate cancer, where there's all these false positives, false alarms, and these poor men, many of whom I've known, you know, go through serial biopsies. Many of them have unnecessary prostate surgery and wind up either incontinent or impotent or both. I mean, it's just dreadful, the type of medicine that is practiced overall that there's a lot of great medicine out there but the problem is it's checkered with this use and reliance on procedures and scans and tests that have notorious track records this is equally personal to me i have 
friends who you know have prostate problems in one case possibly a you know a false negative and as you mentioned lots of these false negatives you know and i wonder despite all of the screening we have you know tremendous numbers of false negatives and one of the things you mentioned which i want to dig a little further into is this notion of incidentaloma if i'm describing it correctly Right, you know, that one of your colleagues referred to is that are we sort of drowning under lots of tests and screenings and, you know, something will yield a false positive and therefore you follow up on that and that itself could lead to other problems and even in some cases, you know, really negative outcomes like death that are resulting from these, you know, large number of screenings. And so, that made me wonder, like, you know, when are second opinions really good? And one of the statistics, again, you know, by the way, I just want to step back a little bit and say a little bit about your book before I get back into the question that I was asking, because the thing I found unique about it is that it not only brought me up to date with the state of the art, because you integrate a huge amount of literature and you make it sort of easy to understand, but it also provided sort of this you know, the need for care and the human element in healthcare. And I, you know, I haven't seen these perspectives like really come together in the way you bring them together. So I really congratulate you on doing that, that, you know, it, it was great reading, uh, you know, brought me up to speed with not just the research, but also the human aspect of healthcare. So I want to come back to what I was asking earlier, which is, how should people think about second opinions if, in fact, you know, one of the statistics you point is that there's only 12 percent agreement with the referring physician with these second opinions? Right. So when I look at that number, I ask myself, should I be comforted by that or should I be worried about getting a second opinion? Right. Is a second opinion just going to increase the chances of a false positive or a false negative, or is it actually going to help improve the outcome? Yes. Well, it's a really important question you're getting at. Um, let me just go back for a second and make sure that um, I don't confuse any listeners. When I say that six people out of 10,000 were helped, I meant with mammography, I meant their, their lives were saved. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not that the, there were many people who did have a diagnosis of breast cancer, but it didn't change their outcome from survival standpoint. Now, the issue that you're bringing up of incidentalomas, that was a term that colleague Zach Cohane, who's at Harvard, came up with, which I thought was a clever way to, to call it. Um, they come up all the time because we use these tests and scans reflexly, promiscuously, and we over-test. In fact, that's one of the only silver linings of the pandemic is that there have been less tests. Of course, that's not perfect because some of those people really do need the right tests and, and things, but because of all the collateral effects of the pandemic, it's actually gone much lower. But the overuse of tests is part of the shallow medicine. So if you don't have time to talk to someone and really you know, probe what's going on, you just order a test. Danielle Ofri, who's a, an NYU physician, leading thought leader of uh, uh, medicine and the humanistic aspects of medicine. She wrote a New England Journal essay about per chance, you know, time to think and how she orders tests like every doctor just because they don't have time. So the second opinion comes into play because if you get a second opinion and it's the same short, you know, rapid system one thinking rather than system two, which is, you know, a real, instead of reflexive, it's reflective and really takes, you know, the whole story of that person into account and listens to the patient and family members if they're also involved. That's what you want in a second opinion is the human in the loop who's going to take time to really, you know, review things and see if something's necessary or the diagnosis is accurate. So your question is, is that second opinion is someone who is going to take the time, who is caring and who is reflective and you know, that's that's the essence. And of course, experienced and, and you know, a, a person who's highly capable. Those are the things that, you know, many second opinions don't include today. 
So I guess ideally it should be the first opinion that does that, right? That does the right. that yeah, does I mean, the deep analysis. Right. Uh, ideally. But you know, I do recommend to a lot of my patients to get a second opinion just because if it's a serious problem, before you embark on a major operation or, you know, on a therapy that has a lot of toxicity potential, you want to be sure you got the right diagnosis. So, you know, I think usually you can't go wrong if it's a serious matter to get a second opinion when there's a big decision to, you know, a big thing to uh, face. But you're right. Ideally, if every first opinion was very carefully delivered with all the right components, that would be better. That would be more efficient. So th what you're getting at is, can machines be the way to get a second opinion? And I do think there's something to that model. It hasn't been proven adequately yet, but if you process all the data, you know, all the data, which uh, the problem you're also getting at is a lot of times physicians miss things because they're in a rush and they don't look at all the data and they don't even have all the data because most people don't have all their records going back and their different providers and all that sort of thing. So if machines could do that uh, with inputs to a deep neural network, well, that would be a booster function, but it, it's still a theoretical benefit. So actually, let's take uh, some of those things you mentioned, which is sort of the deep medicine. And this is a good segue to that. You know, I think I, I mentioned to you that my training in AI actually started with uh, medicine. And there was a, my thesis advisor had built this system called internist in the 70s. And it was a heuristic approach to diagnosis. And I remember spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of hours in that lab and observing physicians talking to this system, talking to internist. And they would describe a case in English, obviously. I mean, we're talking late 70s, early 80s, and engage in a dialogue with the system. Now, and you know, that's sort of part of, I guess, shallow reasoning as well, in that there are heuristics and the system was constructed, you know, over 10 years of interaction between a computer scientist and several experts, uh, including Jack Myers, who was the major uh, source of knowledge for that system. And for the time, it was really impressive. Now, you know, fast forward 40 years, and I, I read your book, and it sort of really got me caught up with this, you know, and when I look at sort of where we've come with machine learning and deep learning, I guess one of the major triumphs of AI recently has been that we made a dent in perception, right? That machines can actually see and read and hear like they couldn't. So in the 70s and 80s, you had to talk to the computer in its language, that is, in terms of a representation it could understand. And by that time, you'd already sort of solved a major part of the problem. That is, if you could actually describe the problem clearly to the machine, then it could use its knowledge base and its, you know, the theory that had been uh, programmed into it and engage in a dialogue and come up with a sort of a sensible interaction and lead towards a, the right differential diagnosis. You know, whereas when I look at machine learning now, it's so different in that machines can see and read and hear, like I said. And so now the input to the machine is the raw data itself. It's the same thing that the physician is looking at. And so that's a major step forward. And, you know, in your book, there's some incredibly compelling examples that I want to get to, such as the retinal scan. You know, our eyes tell us a lot about ourselves and our health. So there's been this major leap in terms of sort of the perceptual capability of machines. How do you, I mean, is that the way you see sort of the advances in medicine? Because, you know, in your description of deep medicine, you talk about three things that are necessary. One is sort of a deep description, which you call deep phenotyping. And I'll ask you to describe that in simple terms. And then there's the deep learning, which is the machine learning. And then there's the deep empathy, which is the caring part of healthcare, right? So just summarize that for us in your terms and tell me if I'm sort of seeing this correctly. And let's start with sort of the first of these things, which is what you mentioned, deep phenotyping. So just sort of explain that to us in simple English. Right. Well, that term 
uh, you know, phenotyping is, you know, the features of applied here to the individual, which there are many layers. So, I mean, it's a multi-layered data story. You know, it's involving a DNA sequence of the person and all the other biologic layers, you know, their proteins and their gut microbiome, uh, you know, for example. And uh, then you have the environment, the exposome, which can be quantified. Uh, along with the physiome by sensors, you know, the anatome by scans, like the ones we were talking about, like, for example, the, the mammogram. You have the electronic health record. You have all these different layers of data, which we can gather, not just, you know, on a single basis, but when appropriate, continuously or, or frequently. But in addition to that, what you're getting at, Rasan, is going deeper. So the retina, which I think is a classic example, actually, uh, when you, when a human expert retinal specialist looks at a retina and you say, is that retina picture from the man or a woman? The chance of that being right is 50% by the retina expert. But the deep neural network gets it right 97% of the time, at least. So the machine picks up through its pixels and its neural network things that humans can't see just when it's trained with, you know, hundreds of thousands of images. Now, it doesn't only pertain to picking up the gender, which you don't need to do a retinal scan to get that, hopefully. But in fact, the point here is that you can get to, as you were touching on, all these other phenotypes about the person. So for example, you could get a, a readout on how well is their blood pressure being controlled, their diabetes, whether they even have diabetes, if, do they have Alzheimer's and how, how much is it progressing? And even, you know, for people with macular degeneration, you could predict what is the right time to prevent or to intervene. It's rich. It's real. There's so much in the retina that we didn't know was there and only manifest through these training uh, neural networks. So when I say deep phenotyping, I mean getting all this data, not just what we collectively have been uh, you know, you, relying on for years in the medical uh, ritual, but also what we can eke out through these various algorithms. And I think it's extraordinary, you know, where this is headed because the retina is just one example, but, you know, wherever you look, you, you see similar things. That's why it's almost whatever you could imagine potentially is worth training machines because you're just going to get so much more informative useful uh, data to help a patient. That, that's deep phenotype. The uh, deep learning we've talked about, and the whole idea is that if you have this data and it's processed with leaning on machines, then you have the gift of time and the ability to reconnect with patients the way it used to be when I was, you know, early on in practice of medicine, you know, back in the 80s, which is so different now than in 2020s. So, I do believe we can do this, but it's going to take, you know, a lot of work. Part about the retinal scan and some other examples in the book really made me, you know, made some sort of some new connections for me. You know, you mentioned Siddhartha Mukherjee's cat, which would curl up, you know, if it curled up beside a patient, then, you know, that was the sh a sure sign, you know, of sort of impending death in that particular case, you know, you speculate that, you know, maybe it's the olfactory sense of the cat. I don't know, maybe it's picking up on some waves, you know, who knows? And in a sense, deep learning is sort of doing something similar, isn't it? In that we have no idea. Well, actually, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say we have no idea. We have some idea, but we don't really understand how the hell the magic actually occurs. You know, you mentioned that human physicians, 50% prediction about, you know, the, the retina belongs to a, a man or a woman, you know, whereas the, the deep learning system is incredibly accurate. Um, I read a paper recently by some of my colleagues at NYU on um, how, I guess I would call it how machines see differently than humans, right? So human radiologists tend to, let's say, focus on uh, the abnormality in a scan, Let, let's say a region of high density or high contrast or something like that, they, that they wouldn't expect to be there. So 
There's that human intelligence that's driving how they acquire information, you know, from a patient, from a scan. Whereas a machine just looks at the whole thing, you know, looks at the whole image and comes up with, you know, an accuracy that is comparable to or surpasses human accuracy. And so machines just seem to see things differently. We have no idea why or how, but somehow it all seems to uh, work and give us sort of an alternative view of what's going on that we can't see as humans. Yeah, I think the point to stress is the term you use, alternative view. It isn't a machine versus man or clinician story. It's a complementary synergistic story. So the, whatever the machine picks up isn't truly integrated with the person. That is, you know, maybe in the future we'll see electronic health record data, lab data, and, you know, all these other things integrated with scans. But today, that's not the case. The, the machines just are trying to interpret the scan, whereas the clinician, the radiologist, or the, the doctor has got a different uh, view. They, they have the person, they are, you know, uh, factoring in many other things that they know about in their experience and in the holistic view of that individual. So, you know, it, this is one of the problems we've had um, in AI for medicine is that we pit one versus the other. And all these papers that come out saying that the, the uh, neural network outperformed the, the physicians or the specialists or whatever, that, that's actually wrong because most of these studies didn't look at the combination approach for even heightened accuracy. The other thing, you know, I think it's important to underscore is that most studies today in AI have been retrospective in silico, where they just look at the data uh, from large data sets, but they don't go prospective. They don't do randomized trials. And so it's not real world. It's pristine data, large annotated data. So when you do the prospective studies, as was done in diabetic retinopathy, one of the first prospective trials, it drops down. That accuracy that, you know, is at 98% turns out to be, you know, like 90%. So the real world is different than the artificial world of AI in retrospective, you know, annotated data sets. So, you know, I think these are important points to keep in mind. We will do better in the future. There will be more prospective studies for sure and when possible or appropriate randomized trials to show that the combination is better than, you know, some of the parts is better than the part. But, you know, I think it's, we're still early in the AI and healthcare medicine story. And I think that's perhaps one of the most important uh, salient points to highlight. So there's several points in the book where I thought, wow, I should get this test. The retinal scan, for example, um, it seems to me that there's enough research pointing to, let's say, the use of individualized information like genomics in improving diagnoses, but they haven't made it into mainstream practice yet. Where are we behind where we've sort of seen the smoking gun, but we're not practicing that yet in sort of day-to-day -day medicine? What are the most compelling areas where the research shows something definitive, but we're lagging and we should be doing more, you know, right, like retinal scans, for example. You know, I thought, you know, that seems like a no-brainer. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting. The OCT, the optical coherence tomogram scan that you're referring to, which is different than just a picture of the retina, in the UK, that's done in everybody each year as part of their eye exam once they get past a certain age. And I wrote in the book about the you know, experience with Pierce Keene, who has a, become a good friend at Moorfields, the leading eye institute in the world uh, in uh, London. And I think that's something we don't do in the US, the retinal scan, this, this OCT. So you can get it, but it's used more sparingly. So that's interesting because almost every test in America is overcooked and overdone, you know? and Getting at the question you're asking with respect to what about these things that sit sequestered in the research domain and don't go into practice, perfect example would be whole genome sequencing. You know, we can do that now for less than $1,000 or even down to $600. And it has a lot of information. 
uh, in it. In fact, so much that we can't even interpret a lot of it because it's still, you know, fuzzy. We don't have a billion people with whole genomes and, and their natural history. But the point is, we can't really unleash that until we validate that whole genome sequencing helps people. You know that it prevents illness or it helps manage illnesses better so we're in this quandary that we already have too many cockamamie tests out there we don't want to add to it but at the same time we got some incredible things like you know for example a blood test that would pick up cancer microscopically before you ever had cancer in people who have a high genomic or family history risk that's you know essentially you know just about ready to go but you know you don't want it to go forward until you prove it unequivocally, who benefits. And so it really comes down to this individualized story that anytime you unleash something broadly, you're going to wind up with a lot of people having unnecessary something. Whereas if you find the right sweet spot, the people who really derive the benefit, the low risk of having things done, that's what you want. And we're early in that. You know, this individualized medicine, the term I prefer much over precision medicine, it really relies on knowing to do the right thing for the right person at the right time. And, you know, we're we're nowhere near that. But, you know, with the deep phenotyping and deep learning, I do think we're going to get there uh, eventually. You know, I was struck by uh, several places in your book. You mentioned the fact that there's tremendous variation among us. Right. I mean, even though we're all human beings and share a lot of similarities, you know, the differences are like striking. Even, you know, in just if I just pick something random like the glycemic response that different people have to uh, different foods, you do see a pattern, but you see tremendous variance among people, which points both to the limitations of sort of the blunt approach to healthcare and shallow medicine, but it also points to the challenges and the opportunities, you know, in that the challenge is really, as you say, individualized medicine, but getting the data all there and demonstrating that it works, I guess that's what you're pointing to as being the challenge. And that's something we're far away from. Right. I mean, I think the more we look, the more we find that each individual is truly unique. In fact, tomorrow, a paper is coming out where we used to think identical twins at least from a DNA standpoint, we knew they were different from an epigenomic standpoint. That is the the packaging, the wrapping of their DNA would be different. But we didn't know until tomorrow when this paper comes out that even identical twins have a different DNA sequence, okay? That we just don't have perfection of identical. There's no identical anybody. And it turns out as you're, I think, emphasizing appropriately, is we are biologically very unique. And of course, that extends to our environment as well. So when the studies came out, and that's a book, a chapter in the book about diet and AI, where you start looking at the glucose response to foods, and if everybody eats the exact same amount, the exact same time, the exact same everything, we have glucose response that's all over the map. And the troubling part of that is that many of us unknowingly have, you know, high glucoses and we have no diabetes. You know, I showed that in my example in the book. And that actually is not uncommon the more we look at that. So what we need to do in the future is nutrition is a big part of healthcare and medicine. It doesn't get enough attention. It's because the studies that have been done to date are pretty questionable. But in the future, we hopefully can guide a person's nutrition to avoid foods that are not healthy for them. Unfortunately, I learned some of the foods that were most unhealthy for me were the ones that were were my favorites. So that didn't make me feel very good about the whole thing. But no, that's just an example of, you know, individualized medicine, individualized everything. You know, that's, we can't assimilate that data as human beings. We need help. It's a lot of data. That study I mentioned that came out of Israel and now has been replicated You know, they had thousands of people with gut microbiome, whole genome sequencing, every food and morsel of food they ate, uh, classified and everything they drank, their physical activity, their sleep, and on and on and on. That's a lot of data. No person is going to be able to, to handle analyzing all that data. And that's, again, why it's exciting to have the capabilities we do now have 
with neural networks. The issue is that um, we are at the cusp of something that's pretty extraordinary because we are generating each person more data than ever before, and that's going to continually expand. But our ability to analyze that data still is not ideal. Deep learning itself is not enough. We need hybrid models to help take all that data to the point where we could have a virtual coach, virtual assistant to help manage a person's illness or predict and prevent an illness that that person otherwise was destined or high risk to to get eventually. So we need the AI scientists to kick in and help us to go beyond just deep learning and develop these hybrid and new models because we still aren't able to keep up with the data. So let's talk about a couple of things you mentioned. Right? So let's talk about prediction, which is what you know deep learning and machine learning sort of really shines. Uh, you know that's where it shines. I guess my question is like, when is it useful? You know, one of the things you mentioned, for example, is that algorithms are better at understanding patterns of mortality than humans are. Right. So an algorithm or a cat, for example, can predict whether someone is going to die. But what do you do with that? Because medicine is about intervention. You know, and I can imagine that, let's say, with mental health, if you can predict, let's say, that someone is leaning towards depression because you're analyzing their speech and you've noticed that their vowel patterns are shortened, right? Maybe you can do something there. Maybe you can intervene. So how do you think about sort of where prediction is most useful in healthcare? And which areas of our life is it really most useful and where is it less useful? Well, a lot of the prediction has not been helpful at all. It's it's for unuseful things, you know, like predicting, you know, from your cardiogram when you're going to die and there's no actionability. All that can do is make people very upset, you know, how long you have to live. Now, in the pandemic, you know, one of the things that's been helpful to exemplify where prediction could be useful is you have the hospitals are full. You, in many places, not just in the U.S., but around the world. And you have people who are sick, have illness of COVID, but you don't know if they have to be hospitalized or where they could be managed at home. And if you had a, a good prediction at, with high accuracy where you could put sensors on them and manage them at home and not put them at any risk, that would be great for the patients, their family potentially, but certainly you know, when we have resources that are limited, also the economics of healthcare. So that hasn't been finalized, but that's a worthy use of prediction. Unfortunately, too many things about prediction. If I predict that you can have Alzheimer's disease and there's no way to modulate that, what good is it? So too much of prediction is for lack of utility. And it, when it's pragmatic, when it can have an impact and it's accurate, validated, prospectively replicated, great. But we don't have many examples of that, frankly. So two questions, and then we'll try and wrap things up. You know, you draw this analogy between medicine and self-driving cars, which, uh, you know, at the moment is one of the big achievements of machine learning. And there are several levels of automation and nirvana is sort of where, you know, the car just sort of does everything and the human does nothing. You know, in an ideal world of healthcare, what do you see as the sort of division of responsibility between humans and machines? You know, there are these levels of automation. And I think you point out that in healthcare, we don't want level five. Maybe we don't even want level four. So just explain that to us. Yeah, well, the what you're getting at. Our analogy, I think, is very useful because there have been some kooky ideas that you could just get rid of doctors and, we, you know, we don't need radiologists. That was what Jeffrey Hinton once said. And, you know, I think these are not sane because that gets to the deep empathy story, which is you have to have humans in the loop for anything that's serious. Now, if it's something that's, you know, a skin rash or, uh, you know, a child with an ear infection or a urinary tract infection, you know, there's a lot of things you could do without a doctor. And that could be, in a way, a level five automated diagnosis through an algorithm. But anything that's important and serious, any matter like that, you've got to have a doctor with oversight. And that's, that's level three, which I think we're, we'll settle at eventually. That is, uh, cars are never going to get to level five because there's always going to be special road conditions and you know special situations where you can't rely on 
on a car to drive itself. And that's the same thing with medicine. We, we're going to need doctors, clinicians to help patients, and they're not going to go away. And so we should stop this talk about getting rid of doctors, in fact. But what we want to do is get deploy their efforts in the best way, which is connecting much deeper with patients. That's the overarching goal. So talking about uh, physicians, you know, you're different in the sense that, you know, you embrace technology relatively early in your career and actually, you know, deeply well-versed with AI and, and medicine. You know, I was struck by examples in your book where you said, you know, I think physicians should learn Bayes' rule. And I, I think everyone should learn Bayes' rule. <laughs> but, you know, should medical training, current medical training, include training in, you know, in statistics, Bayes' rule, and machine learning? It, it seems to me that in this day and age, and especially in the emerging sort of brave new world that uh, we're entering, that would seem like a prerequisite for you know, someone going into healthcare is to understand the capabilities and limitations of machines. Absolutely. Uh, and to be able to integrate them into uh, healthcare. Right. No, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, that was a point I tried to really emphasize that we need to gear up and that should be part of the medical uh, school curriculum now. You know, there isn't enough, there hasn't been enough on statistical considerations, but now with machine learning, that needs to be uh, integrated. It doesn't mean that you know, physicians are going to be doing deep neural network uh, coding, and, uh, but they have to be under, uh, fully understanding of the nuances and how they can get off track because they're going to be using them more and more in helping to manage uh, and helping to diagnose patients. There's one last question that I do want to ask you, which is if we were to leave our future selves with the present 100 years from now, what would that be? What would people look back and say, wow, that was farsighted, it had foresight, and thank you for that. What what would that present look like? Well, I just hope we get back the, the human connection. I think that's what's so, I think uh, we, we've lost it in a large way. And I hope that if we go forward, it'll be deeper than ever. And someday they'll look back and say, you know, back in, in, in our lifetime that we were um, so silly to so quickly let it slide and uh, be abandoned. And, uh, you know, what makes us human is what I think is something we have to push on, get back and make it as, uh, you know, the center, uh, which it isn't today. Thanks, Eric. Thank you for sharing your time and expertise. Greatly appreciated. You bet. Good to talk to you and good luck with your continued brave new world. Thank you. <laughs> 